Peter says the end of all things is near. Therefore be, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I wanted to start off by sharing the verse of where we're to fix our hope completely on, but but what are we to be doing now? And Peter is reminding reminding these Jews, the the dispersed, the those of the dispersion, primarily Jewish believers, is is who Peter's writing to as the apostle to the Jews, just like James is his book is primarily written to the Jews, the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Um, does that mean it's not for us if, unless we're a Jew? No, by no means. But it does help us to, to understand who it's written to and uh, helps us relate to it more and understand it uh, more fully and apply it to ourselves. But he says the end of all things is, is near. The end, the end of all things. What is he referring to here? Is he referring to the end of the world? Is he referring to the end of their life, the end of their suffering, the return of Christ? Um, it's really hard to say with absolute certainty. And for time's sake, I left off, but as we go through... Peter refers to the return of Christ and, and to, uh, to our own end, to the brevity of life, often in, in his epistles. And Bar- Albert Barnes says this about it, and I tend to agree with him. He says the, the phrase, the end of all things, would naturally refer to the end of the world, the winding up of human affairs. It is not absolutely certain, however, that the apostle used it here for this sense. It might mean that so far as they were concerned, or in respect to them, the end of all things uh, is drawing near. Death is to each one the end of all things here below, the end of his plans and the, in, and the interest in all that pertains to uh, sublunary affairs. To be honest, whether he is referring to the end of the world or to the end of our life, as he, as he said in quoting uh, from the Old Testament, uh, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of en- the Lord endures forever. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference because our end is near. Whether it's in the Lord coming back or it's our going to be with him, the, the death of the body. The end is near. So I've heard people kind of, kind of argue about what it is, but it doesn't matter. The end is near. Um, in his second epistle, he reminds us uh, that do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Time doesn't matter to the Lord. He's, he's the maker of time. But the end of all things is near. So how should we be acting? Knowing that our life is short. Knowing that our life is like the grass that just, the sun comes out, it withers away, and it's gone. It's seasonal. We're to be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Um. Because of the brevity of this life, we should be people that are much in prayer. Um, it's actually prayers. It's actually plural. And I, I think he is referring to all types of prayers. 
Um, a lot of a lot of people are really are really big and really emphasize you need to have a, a special quiet time every day with the Lord, and that is that is certainly good, and I would recommend that that you spend time with the Lord. But we're to always be aware of the Lord, and we're to always be aware of our need, of our shortcomings, of our weaknesses. And our need for Him, didn't our Lord say, apart from me you can do nothing? So do we think we can go through our day without talking to the Lord, seeking the Lord's help, looking for wisdom? In prayers, we're we're to be sober-minded. Because our life is short, we need to think with sound judgment and be sober in spirit for the purpose of prayer. Realizing things, Throughout the day, we should be praying. There should be just prayers flowing out of us at all times, whether it's we we mess up, we sin, and just, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, Uh, please help me. Or there's a task that's difficult to do. Um, I've often been uh, embarrassed by my wife and children when uh, you lose your keys or misplace your wallet or there's something and you're just going around frantically looking for it and you can't find it and and the 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 call will come have you prayed and i cannot tell you how many times if we just stop and lord help me and something simple like like losing your keys or misplacing something our, our relationship should be just that right with the lord a relationship in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths in all your ways, acknowledging his presence. He is there with me. He desires me to come to him. He desires me to pray. The end of all things is near. We, we should have eternity in our minds. We should realize this life is short. The younger you are, the harder that is to realize. The older you get, the more you go, wow, wow. I'm fit, how old am I? 52? 51? I don't feel like it. Always used to laugh when adults would say that. Life is short. I don't have much longer left. And I'm not that old, really. But I'm old enough to know, wow, uh, I, it goes by. We need to be thinking rightly about the time that we have. We need to be sober minded. Sober, sober in judgment, thinking correctly about the situation. A lot of people associate sober-mindedness with just this stern seriousness. That, that's not it. It's thinking correctly about the situation. Sometimes sober-mindedness means belly laughing as you're fellowshipping with other believers and it's just, just a good time of cutting up and, and just laughing together. If it's correct and it's proper, be sober-minded and don't put on the sour face with everyone else and think, oh, these people that aren't spiritual. But there's other times you shouldn't be laughing. There's times we should be weeping. There's times we should be serious. There's times we should be angry. Be angry and sin not. There's times sobriety calls for anger. The end of all things is near. Be of sound judgment and sober in spirit for the purpose of prayers. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, if, if someone's giving you a list of things to do and they say, oh yeah, above all, don't forget to do this. What do they want you to remember more than anything else? What they say next. Above all, above everything else, you can go through the epistles. You can go through his epistle here. The instructions that he gives for all believers to submit ourselves to every human institution. How servants should submit themselves to the masters. How we've all been called to follow the sufferings of Christ. How wives are submit to their husbands. How husbands are to live with their wives in an understanding way, all of us being harmonious, all the different things He gives. 
But as he says, and he reminds us that the end of all things is near, and we're to to have sound judgment, to be sober in spirit for the purpose of prayer, he says, above all, this is of most importance, keep fervent in your love for one another. He didn't say, well, love, love one another as much as you can. He says, be fervent in your love for one another. Let me ask y'all a question. Are y'all fervent in your love for one another? It's our Lord's desire. It's the only command given to us. It's the law of the new covenant. It's the law that the church is to follow. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you love one another. It's the way that the world will know that we are Christians, right? By our love for one another inside the church, inside the body. Do good to all, especially the household of faith, especially the church. Church, The needs of the congregation should come before the needs of the world and and reaching out and ministering to the world with with different things. First, here, if if you're a husband or if you're if you're a man in the family, if you're a woman with, with children, or if you hope to, who do you take care of first? Who should you take care of first? Your neighbors, their children, their well-being, or your own household? Whoever does not care for his own household is worse than an infidel. It's, we are the family of God. We are the body of Christ. We are to love one another fervently, zealously, seeking to outdo one another in good deeds. If there's going to be any competition within the church, it should be on loving one another. Oh yeah, well I can love you more. You're going to bless me? Well, I'm going to bless you more. But it's with an attitude of, of thanksgiving. Be fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. He's quoting from from Proverbs. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of sins. We're to be like our Savior in this respect towards one another. Think about what Christ has forgiven you. Think about the love shown towards you by God in giving His only begotten Son. Of Him bearing our sins in His body on the tree of Him suffering our hell like Kevin pointed out earlier in the song. The love of God. One of my my favorite verses and just one of the most helpful, helpful passages that there is in Philippians. In Philippians 2, he says, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection... And compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but He emptied Himself. should be emptying ourselves for one another. Taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Pride has no place in the church. Thinking some job is too low to do some, some help, some thing that needs to be done, thinking it's below us, that is no place in the body of Christ. That is not fervently loving one another. We should always be thinking of others in all that we do. Love covers a multitude of sins. Has your brother sinned against you? So what? What should you do? If your brother sins against you, against you what should you do? Go to him. Not in anger. Maybe he doesn't realize it. Maybe he's what love love thinks, thinks, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Maybe my brother sinned against me because he's in a really bad place right now. 
spiritually. Maybe he's struggling. Maybe he doesn't realize it. Go to him. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his waves saves his soul. Go to him. We've got to get, I don't, maybe it's not a problem here. Maybe Americans are just more sensitive and touchy and I, I don't know. We've got to get, this, get past this place of putting on a false face. We, we have to be naked before one another. What was Adam's problem? When he sinned in the garden, what did Adam do? He ran and hid, tried to blend into his surroundings, covering himself with leaves. What should he have done? When he, heard, when he heard the Lord walking in the cool of the evening, what should he have done? He should have run out into the open and run to his, his father and said, I've sinned against you. We need to be like Adam should have been. We're, we're, we've been made a new person, a new creation. Be transparent with one another. Do you think someone has a problem with you? Go to them and say, hey, is there a problem between us? And either they'll say no or they'll say yes. And then you can deal with it and it's out in the open. Love covers a multitude of sins. This is what love looks like. It's not some gushy, gushy, oh, we hug each other, we, we shake hands, we kiss each other. It's, it's caring for one another, thinking the best about one another, wanting the best for one another. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Is it really hospitality if you have someone over to your house and maybe they stay a little bit longer than you would want them to stay because you're busy and you've got things to do and you start, oh, when are they going to leave? Be hospitable to one another without complaint. You don't go into the kitchen where they can't and start husbands of life. Oh, I can't believe they're still here. What are, what are their needs? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying there's not a right time to say, look, I've, I've got something I need to do. I really want to stay and, and, and fellowship more, but I, I really need to, to do something. But that's only if you really do need to do something. Be hospitable without complaint, without mumbling and and groaning about it. Each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each one of us has received a gift. The NAS says a special gift. We're to employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. This is one place, I, this past Sunday was the, the, first, the first meeting of those that are professing uh, believers among the, the refugees. It was the first meeting that was there and, and I, got to, I got to preach to them and one thing that I told them is they have two enemies. Uh, one is the devil and the other is their flesh. One wants to attack us from the outside. The one wants to trip us up and make us stumble from the inside. And, and time after time after time, the enemy wants to come in and, and be divisive and, and trouble us as, as a church. And he wants to turn us against one another. What was, what was the high priestly prayer of Christ? That we be one even as he and the Father are one. Christ prayed for our unity in the church. If If Christ wanted that, that he prayed about that to the Father for the church, where do you think the devil is going to attack you? It's in unity. In Ephesians, he he names, gives a, a, a list of the the uh, the works of the of the flesh, and he says they're evident. And the majority of them that he lists are not the drunkenness, the sexual immorality, and those things. Although he does list them, but he lists enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. And things like these. 
One thing I, I always try to encourage our church back home is what I'm encouraging you now and what I just said a little earlier. Be transparent with one another. Be, be naked before each other. And I think you know what I mean by that. Don't hide. Are you upset? Don't sit on a fake smiley face. Let others know. They can encourage you and help you, but we don't want that, do we? Usually when we're upset, we just want to be left alone because that's not what we need because our flesh is selfish and I just want to, I want to be upset. And the devil wants that for us. Envy. Envy. That is huge in the church, especially biblical churches where everyone wants to be the evangelist, wants to be the teacher, wants to be the one seen as, as knowing so much about Scripture. But, brothers, so-and-so got asked to teach when the preacher was gone. I'm a better teacher than he is. I've got way more Scripture memorized. There was a young man that fell away probably has more scripture memorized than everyone in this room put together. He's a walking Bible and he fell away. He turned his back and left after years of being in biblical churches. Why? He wanted to be a man pleaser. Everything that he did over those years was to please men and to appear righteous in the sight of men. We're to do all that we do for the glory of God. And what does he say? Each one has received a gift. Employ it in serving one another. We could go to 1 Corinthians for the sake of time. I won't. I think y'all are probably familiar with it. What is the purpose of spiritual, spiritual gifts to the church? It's for the church to build up one another. It's not to elevate oneself. Oh, but it says earnestly desire the better gifts. I'm convinced he's writing that to the church, not to an individual. Not you desire a better gift. Lord, give us preachers in the church. Give us evangelists in the church. Give us prophets in the church. Give us who wants to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Come on, everyone should have your hand up. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? The one who serves. The one who serves. The greatest among you will be the servant of all. It, whether, whether or not you believe there will be an actual banquet feast in heaven when we get there, it really doesn't matter but the Lord says he will gird himself and serve us. I, I, I often, I think about that. The, you, you picture the, the big banquet table there and all the, all the saints sitting down for a meal and everything is turned upside down. As Christ himself will serve us as the apostles would serve us. And we would be sitting at the table saying, man, I wish I could be serving. We have the opportunity now. Empty yourselves by serving one another. Imitate your Lord by serving one another. Love one another fervently. The manifold grace of God. If you've received anything, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold, the variety, many colored, I think is the the actual Greek meaning of it. It's like variegated or the facets of a diamond. There's many 
many graces of God. And not all of us have the same grace. Not all of us have the same gift. Now, I I don't know. I don't know if Kevin would agree with me on this or not. I'm... This seems to be a, a minority report. Um, a lot of people put a, an emphasis on knowing your gift so that you can use it. At, at my church, I tell people, don't worry about what your gift is. You don't need to know what your gift is in order to use it. Just serve. Oftentimes, Knowing your gift will hinder you from doing those other things. Oh, well, I'm not an evangelist. I don't have the gift of evangelist, so I don't need to tell anyone about Christ because that's what the evangelists do. Oh, well, I don't have the gift of serving, so I'll let someone else set up the chairs. You know, I'm a teacher. (laughs) So, you know. As soon as y'all are done setting up the chairs and sit down, then it's my turn. No. Wasn't it Christ that girded his waist and got down and did the, the job of the lowest servant in washing the disciples' feet? There's many gifts, but they're all for the building up of one another. You don't need to know your gift. Just do whatever you see that's needed. Pray the Lord would show you things that are needed, that you can do. You're not required to do what you can't do, but you are required to do what you can do. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Those that speak, this is almost certainly referring to teachers, preachers. Realize that what you're teaching what you're preaching is the very words of the living God. And to do so likewise, to treat it as such. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Now scripture says to each one has been given a measure of faith. And there are a variety of gifts, but it's all the same spirit that gives the gifts. And there is a variety of strength. Not everyone is the same. Not everyone is strong in everything. And God designed it that way. If we could get a hold of this, we're not supposed to be like each other in our abilities and what we're able to do. We're supposed to be different because we are a body and each one individually a member of of the body, so that we're not all an eye, we're not all a foot, we're not all a hand. We're each one different. And God is the one that chooses. So don't murmur and complain against God. Don't speak evil about God. He gives the gifts. Not only that, He gives the strength. He gives the faith in which we are to walk in, in which we're to exercise those gifts in. Our gifts for serving Not everyone is going to serve as much as other people. After all, in the early church, when there got to be too much for the apostles to do, and they said, you pick out seven men that we can turn this this idea of waiting on tables over to, the first deacons of the church, you pick out seven men, and and then we we will put them over these things. Who did they go find? There were men that excelled. There were men that excelled above others and the people recognized that and saw it and they said, he needs to do this. He's gifted. The Lord is with them. He's full of the Holy Spirit and empowered to do this. And they employed them in doing that in serving the church. But also in the strength of which God supplies, we're not to do things in our own strength. And one of the worst things for you is to succeed if you do something in your own strength. It's not to fail. That would be the best thing for you. The worst thing that could, for a believer to do if he's doing something in his own strength and his own power, the worst thing that can happen is for you to succeed. 
because it's failure that turns the believer's heart back to the Lord and reminds us, I can do nothing without Christ. And it sends us right back into being sober-minded for the purpose of prayers. We need to be sure that we're doing things in the strength that the Lord supplies, not our own strength, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. It's a scary thing when, when someone praises you. We are told let, let another praise you and not yourself. We certainly don't want to be pride and arrogant going around boasting about how good we are. But it can be, it can be a scary thing to be praised by others because what we want to do is say what? Well, praise the Lord. It was the Lord's doing, not mine. So that in all things, God may be glorified. See, th- this takes the Spirit of God to accomplish this. For a bunch of people to live closely together, meeting several times a week in each other's lives. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how y'all are here. We have, been, we have been very blessed by the Lord in our church and that we're, we're very close. It goes beyond the meeting times and we're, we're in each other's lives quite a bit. That, that is both a blessing and there's also dangers that can come from it. You, you know, especially those of you who are married or you have brothers or sisters, it's the people that you are closest to that we often treat more poorly than others. And so the closer a church gets together, well, the more faults we see in one another, which is all the more reason why we need to be fervent in our love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't go around talking about people behind their back and being envious of other people and jealous of other people because they get, they get picked. You want to know if you're spiritual? Pray, do you praise the Lord really, truly, honestly, genuinely, in private with no one else around when someone else is promoted? That takes a spiritual person to do that. This says, oh, thank you for my brother. Thank you, Lord, for, for what you're doing with him, for what you've done in his life, for how you've blessed him and strengthened him, and then pray for him that the Lord would bless him more. That's a sign of love. That, that's your being fervent in love then if it's coming out of a pure heart like that. And it's all to the glory of Christ. Christ is getting the glory because we're recognizing God is the one that gives us the strength. God is the one that gives us the gift. God is the one who first loved us so that we know how to love one another. God is the one that helps us by His Word, by, by desiring, longing for the pure milk of the Word that we may grow by it. It's by this that we realize our need for one another. And for the body to be close, to be united, to be knit together, to be one for the glory of God. So that in all things, God may be glorified. They will know you are Christians by your love for one another. Do your good deeds so that they will be seen by others. So that God will be glorified. Not from the heart to be seen by others, but so that Christ is seen in your love for one another and and the love for the world, for the lost. So that all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Our love for God is seen by our love for Christ. And our love for Christ is seen by our love for one another. Do you realize that's the only way you can see your love for Christ? The only way you can see your love, someone's love for Christ is in their love for the church, for one another. That's the place it's seen. It's what Jesus said, right? It's talking about the judgment when he separates the sheep and the goat. And what does he say to the the sheep? I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me something. When, When did we do this, Lord? When did we see you hungry and thirsty and naked and in prison? As often as you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. 
Do you love Christ? Then you will love one another. It's the place that's seen. It's the place that's expressed. It's the place that's shown where others can see. To whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. All the praise, all the glory belongs to God anyway. We behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the only place we truly see the face of Christ is in each other. That that may sound a little off to some, but it should be Christ in each other. What makes us love each other so much knowing that the, these are people that my Lord has, has died for. These are my brothers and my sisters. Amen. Amen. It's, it's really easy, right? So there'll be no problem in doing it. <laughs> but it will be a joy to do it. It will be a joy to do it. And the Lord will be glorified. Amen, let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Christ. Lord, I pray you would teach us. Lord, teach me to be a servant of all. Lord, help us to consider ourselves just unworthy servants who have done what we were told to do. That Christ would be glorified. That he would be seen as beautiful. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.